Yeah, I did it. I got the Apple Vision Pro. I played with it for about 12 hours over the weekend, and I've changed my mind about it more times than I want to admit. It's still a new device with very limited app support and bugs that need to be worked out. On top of all that, the media, Apple's marketing, and social media have all done weird things to my expectations. So rather than making a first impressions video where I gush about all the cool stuff and exude excitement, I wanted to take a minute and let my thoughts simmer. This is not going to be a full review or an unboxing. Plenty of other people have done the unboxings, and it's still too early for anybody to do a full review. If you do want to see those kind of things, check out Marquez Brownlee or Brian Tong's channels. They've both done some fantastic coverage. I should also mention that I did not drop $4,500 on this out of my own pocket. I have a client that I've been working with on some other XR projects, and they offered to reimburse me for the base cost of the Apple Vision Pro so we could explore how we might use it in their organization. I still had to shell out some of my own money for upgrades and add-ons, uh, but certainly nowhere near the total cost. And I'll be totally honest with you here. If it wasn't for my client paying for it, I almost certainly would be returning this before the two weeks are up. Don't get me wrong, though. Uh, it's an incredible piece of hardware, and it has awesome potential. And really, the money isn't even the biggest issue. I would probably return it because I see this thing as a beautiful but very flawed version of what it will eventually become. And right now, there just isn't enough value to justify that high price tag. So here, I'm just going to give you my preliminary opinions. I intended to include a section about use cases and how this device fits or doesn't fit, but that made this video way too long. So instead, I'm going to put a bit more thought into it, and I'll do a follow-up video later this week or earlier next week with the use cases. Now, I just want to start by saying that I don't want to compare this to other devices on the market. Part of that is because this is a different device with different features and different use cases. Yes, it can do a lot of the things that other VR devices do, uh, but on the other hand, it can't do some things that you would expect from a VR device. Apple is trying to position this as a totally different experience, and that's why they're using the term spatial computing. They've got some similar features and there's some crossover, but they really are entirely different things. I do have thoughts about how it compares to other devices, so I'm already outlining a video to go over those. I want to wait a few weeks for that one though, since I anticipate that the app landscape will change pretty quickly, and comparing hardware and specs uh, doesn't paint the full picture. One of the things that's been on my mind since getting the Apple Vision Pro, uh, with all the power in this device, a lot of people have been saying that it's like strapping a MacBook Pro to your face. Unfortunately, I just don't see it that way after using it for a few days. The operating system is much more like iOS uh, than it is macOS, for starters, uh, meaning that we'll never get that same level of productivity as we do with laptops. And at least until developers start dreaming up killer apps, it's essentially an expensive entertainment device. So rather than a MacBook on my face, it's more like an Apple TV. Apple also talks a lot about the Vision Pro being a productivity device. And again, uh, I'm just not seeing it. Maybe your definitions of productivity are a little bit different. Maybe they're talking about personal productivity and lifestyle apps, things where recipe managers and to-do lists are considered productive. For me, productivity means business. And aside from Microsoft Office and a few other things, I don't see it. I'm not saying that it won't someday be the ultimate productivity device. I'm just saying that right now it isn't. When I look at the Apple Vision Pro right now, I see a very expensive media consumption device. That's no surprise though. When the iPad first came out, it was the same way. It was a place for us to watch videos, to look at our photos, and to surf the internet. It didn't have a lot of the apps that we use today and rely on for our businesses and our personal lives. The success or the failure of the Apple Vision Pro is going to rest solely in the hands of the developers who dream up things that I can't even imagine. Now, let's talk about my initial thoughts on different aspects of the device. We'll start with the elephant in the room, and that is the price tag. When everything's all said and done, the prescription lenses, Apple Care, and upgraded storage, you're really looking at $4,000 to $4,500 for this thing. And that's just insane. At this price, the Apple Vision Pro is not something that's ever going to be a mass consumer product. And I don't think they mean for it to be right now. This is really something that they want in the hands of enthusiasts. They want it in the hands of developers. They want to start creating an ecosystem around this. And hopefully by the time the next version comes out, the technology will be there to slim it down and make it cheaper. 
It probably won't be a sub $1,000 pair of glasses in the next generation, but I think that's the eventual goal. Hopefully, though, it will be lighter, it will be more comfortable, and it will be a lot cheaper so that regular people can start to buy this thing. Now, let's talk about build quality. The build quality of this headset is fantastic. There are no wiggly parts, nothing rattles, and the materials feel premium. This is exactly what I'd expect from Apple and from a device in this price range. They thought through so many details. For example, removing the head strap is simply a matter of pulling these orange tabs. I've never seen a headset where it's so easy to swap straps. And the attention to detail and the build quality is probably why it's so disappointing that they missed so many other things like comfort, which I'll get to in a minute. The Apple Vision Pro is also heavy. It's definitely one of the heaviest devices that I've used of this generation, and that's even without the battery pack. Cutting down on the weight is definitely something that Apple is going to need to do in future iterations especially since it directly impacts one of the biggest complaints that I and others have, and that's the comfort. After wearing this thing for 30 to 45 minutes, it does start to get uncomfortable. And that's not just because of the weight, it, although that is a big factor. They just don't have the comfort dialed in nearly as much as I would have expected from Apple. Part of it is the way that it sits on your face. Right now, with the solo knit band, most of the pressure is on your forehead and on your cheeks. And with the dual loop band, it puts pressure in some other places like your cheeks, your nose, and the top of your head. I went to the Apple store to talk to the person that they sent to Cupertino who learned how to do the fittings. The biggest thing that he pointed out is that a lot of people tend to ratchet this thing down to really get it tight and suction it onto their faces like you would ski goggles. And that's not the way that this is meant to be worn. You're actually supposed to wear it loose enough that it barely sits there without bouncing around. He also said that if you have too much weight on the top of your forehead, you should pull the band down in the back a little bit. And if you feel too much weight on your cheeks, you should pull it up a little. Once I loosened it up and made a few small adjustments, it did start to feel better, although it isn't what I'd call comfortable. The other thing is that this band is not for everybody. Everyone has a different shaped head, so if the solo knit band doesn't work, they also did include the dual loop band. It doesn't look nearly as sexy. But from what I'm hearing, people find this to be much more comfortable. For me, I, I found the two bands to be differently comfortable. The solo knit band was definitely the more comfortable one to wear for short periods, uh, but for longer periods, I found that the dual loop was a little bit more comfortable. I think what I end up using is really going to be a matter of what I want to do at the time. I'm also really looking forward to seeing what third parties do with different straps. I should say though, for reference, that I can easily wear the MetaQuest 3 Elite strap or the Bobo M3 strap all day long with no discomfort. So this is not just a matter of me not liking things on my face. We've all seen the videos of the Apple Vision Pro where the person's eyes show in an external display. In the promo videos, it looks cool, but in reality, it's a cross between creepy and disappointing. The truth is that the display is very hard to see and the eyes fall squarely into the uncanny valley. That's where they're close enough to reality that they don't look cartoonish, but far enough that they don't look real. The result is creepy eyes. The eyes also don't show up all the time. They only show when you're near a person and looking at them. Otherwise, the external display shows different things to indicate whether a person is working in an interactive experience or recording a video. Now, let's flip this over so I can show you the light seal. I love how Apple designed this thing with magnets and custom sizing. It makes changing these things out so much easier than any other headset that I've tested with our clunky clips and snaps. Let's say, for example, that I want to share this with other people in my house, but they don't want to put their face where my greasy face has been. All they need to do is pop this magnetic pad right off, and they can put theirs on and start using it. If their face is shaped differently than mine, again, it's not a big deal. This whole light seal comes right off with magnets. They can just have theirs ready that's fit for them and pop it right on. Really, it's, it's that simple. There are no clips to worry about. There's no fidgeting. It's just that easy. The one downside to the magnetic seal, though, is that you have to remember to hold the Vision Pro by the faceplate or by the arms. It's, this is counterintuitive, since I don't want to get fingerprints on the glass and the arms are semi-flexible. And I'll admit, I've come close to dropping this thing a few times by grabbing it by the light seal. Just like the light seal, the prescription lenses are also held on with magnets. Sometimes I wear contact lenses and sometimes I wear glasses, so I appreciate being able to install and remove these things without any fidgeting. The lenses themselves are crystal clear and way better than the inserts that I've used in some other devices. 
A lot of people hate this battery pack, and they talk about how this was such a stupid decision. They hate the external battery and the cord. I'll be honest, it's not as elegant as an all-in-one solution, but it's really not that bad. And I would definitely rather carry the battery weight in my pocket or on my desk than strapped to my head. I would challenge anybody to go to the Apple Store to do a demonstration of the, of the Vision Pro. After about five minutes, you don't even notice the battery or the cable. Speaking of the cable, it connects to the device pretty well. It's got a proprietary connector with a twist lock on there. And while I prefer standardized connectors wherever possible, I think they made the right decision by using this. Once the headset's on, the cable goes right behind your ear and you don't even notice it. If anything, it feels just like wearing a pair of glasses. Overall, the battery thing is fine with me. It's a compromise. I hate saying that there are compromises because of the high price tag, but that's just the nature of technology. Everything is a trade-off between cost, efficiency, weight, and so many other factors. I'm sure you've already heard plenty of things about the display and how incredible it looks. There's no denying that the display on this thing is probably one of the best on the market. It looks fantastic when you put it on your face. The lenses are great, the micro OLEDs are great, and the resolution is so sharp it's lifelike. There is one issue with the display that's more related to the lens type that Apple uses than anything else though. In some high contrast scenes, uh, especially when there's white text on a black background, you'll notice a lot of distracting reflections. Unfortunately, there is not much that can be done about it, and the pancake lenses that Apple's using right now give us the best possible picture otherwise. The biggest problem with the screens, in my opinion, is the motion blur. It's not something that you're going to notice too much when you're sitting still, unless you're turning your head back and forth. But if you're up and walking around, you're probably going to notice it, especially in darker places. Part of the motion blur is due to the cameras, especially in low light situations, but most of it is because of the screens Apple chose to use. Micro OLEDs suffer from a problem called persistence, which causes motion blur. It's just another trade-off that Apple made to give us such a beautiful image otherwise. Another downside of the display is that the field of view is a little more limited than I would have expected. It's not terrible, but it doesn't match what other headsets in this generation offer. It's a little like looking through ski goggles, which is funny to me because the Apple Vision Pro looks like a pair of high-tech ski goggles. In practice, though, I get used to it pretty quickly, and it's not so bad that it bothers me. Again, though, it's all about compromises. To listen to Apple's marketing, you'd think that the past view view on this thing looks just like real life. The fact that the pre-launch influencers all showed pass-through in better-than-ideal lighting conditions with studio lights only helped to push that narrative. And since the Apple Store is also so well lit, any demos that you do there are also going to look amazing. The reality of it, though, is that the pass-through looks good in normal light, but it struggles in low light. Despite that, it's still the best pass-through on the market. Optics are still optics, and Apple's reality distortion field can't change the laws of physics. It's going to struggle in high contrast scenes, and in low light, you're going to get some graininess. That's just a matter of aperture shutter speed and ISO. It doesn't matter how much AI they throw at this thing, it's never going to look quite as good as a bright controlled lighting. And they're going to sacrifice noise to make sure that the frame rate stays high enough that you don't get motion sick. Now, all that said, I can still read the occasional message uh, on my phone with it just fine. I can see my tablet and laptop. I could even read words written on paper if I needed to, although that wouldn't be the most comfortable thing in the world to read a book. Um, I did notice, though, that after about six feet, it starts to get a little bit blurry. For example, I was using my Apple Vision Pro while my wife and I were watching television together, and I could see what was happening on the TV, but it wasn't crystal clear, and I couldn't make out the closed captions. Now, I shouldn't be surprised by this, but holy crap, the audio quality in this thing is just mind-blowing. It sounds better than some professional-grade audio systems that I've heard, and it all comes from these tiny little speakers right here next to your ears. Putting this on, it really does feel like you're sitting in a theater with surround sound. How they achieve that with these tiny things, I have no idea, but congratulations to them for doing it. It's unbelievable. And yes, I'm sure audiophiles are going to correct me, and they're going to talk about the clipped high frequencies, but I don't care. It still sounds phenomenal to me and to most other people that I've talked to. The only real complaint I have with the audio is how loud it is to anyone else in the room. The Vision Pro doesn't aim the sound directly into your ears like other devices do, so if you want privacy, you'll need to wear headphones. Luckily, AirPods pair with your Vision Pro just as easily as they do with any other Apple device. Performance on this thing is hard to measure. 
Part of that is because we don't have software that's pushing the boundaries yet, and part of it is that there isn't much to compare it to. Uh, what I can tell you is that I haven't seen it struggle with anything yet, and I suspect that there's a lot of room for it to grow. One of the really unique things about the Apple Vision Pro is its eye tracking. This isn't the first device to include eye tracking, but it manages to blow every other eye tracking system out of the water. Like, it's not even close. I've never seen anything as fast and precise as this. On top of that, they make it really easy to calibrate. If for whatever reason it starts to get off track, you just go through a little 30 second process to look at some dots, up, over, all the way around, and the next thing you know, it's locked in again. The whole look and pinch interface also works much better than I ever expected. It works perfectly nearly every time I use it. Of course, there are rare times when it doesn't work, which causes problems, but those are the exceptions, not the rule. For example, on the LinkedIn website, I can't click on the little like button and choose a heart. I haven't looked at the code, but I suspect that it's just part of the JavaScript on that page. I've also seen some cookie banners where it doesn't work, but again, hopefully those will get corrected over time. Apple has done a great job of creating some guidelines on how to program for this thing, and as long as developers keep those in mind, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. As for websites, well, they're kind of the Wild West, where anybody can do whatever the heck they want. Uh, the good news is, though, again, as long as they follow standard accessibility guidelines, they should also work without any real issues. Speaking of websites, there is one glaring exception. WebXR is a technology that brings virtual reality to the web. Right now, it doesn't work with the Apple Vision Pro. I've heard that you can make it work by unlocking some flags in Safari, but you're still going to be limited in what you can do because of Apple's control scheme. And this brings me to another one of my big disappointments with the Apple Vision Pro, and that's the lack of controllers. You have to use your hands and your eyesight to control everything, unless you hook up a keyboard or trackpad. The thought behind this is that by looking and pinching and swiping, you can do most of the same things that you do with a mouse or a trackpad. You can target things by looking at them. Pinching is similar to clicking or tapping, and swiping is that same swipe gesture that we've used on other Apple products. And you can even do a two-finger pinch gesture in some apps to resize or rotate. It's all pretty familiar. My problem is that it feels like they haven't given much thought to controls beyond what we already do in 2D space. I personally think that it's a little bit short-sighted for a spatial computing device to not have the ability to do more than what we're used to doing with 2D input. And I worry that it's going to limit the innovative applications that could otherwise be possible. I get it, though. Apple doesn't want anything to come between you, the person, and what you're trying to accomplish with the technology. By adding controls into the mix, it just adds one more barrier. And they want to make interacting with the Apple Vision Pro as seamless and as frictionless as possible. In my opinion, though, it makes it feel a little bit clumsy. Hand tracking, no matter how good the technology is, is never going to be as fast as a controller. The accelerometers and the built-in cameras make it so that controllers can precisely track their movement in space. Limiting input to what you can do with your bare hands is going to make it a lot harder to do some things, too. For example, with a controller, you've got motion, uh, where in space it's moving. You'll normally have thumbsticks that are able to control and manipulate things. You also have buttons that you can push, and triggers to pull. I understand, though, that's a lot of things to remember. And I get it. For someone who's not used to working with controllers, it can be very overwhelming. Taking that controller away makes it just a little bit friendlier, but it also makes it just a little less usable. I'm thinking about times when I need to grab something in space and manipulate it, or if I need to hold something and take an action on it. Yes, I can do that with a pinch gesture, but what about a secondary action if I'm holding something? I don't really have a secondary action to use. Maybe I could use a second finger, but again, that's kind of awkward. So it's going to be interesting to see how developers work around that limitation. People who have used other headsets are used to being able to push a button and do certain things, but we can't really do that with the Apple Vision Pro. Now let's back up for a minute and talk about the OS. The operating system in the Apple Vision Pro is incredibly complex. Creating an operating system for a spatial computing platform or a VR platform is a monumental undertaking, and Apple has done an admirable job for version 1.0. There's still a long way to go, though. There are still a lot of bugs, but that's to be expected. Even so, I still think it's one of the most polished operating systems I've ever used on a device like this. One of the things that really stands out to me is the new user experience. Other devices have been painful at best and frustrating at worst. The Apple Vision Pro was friendly and Apple simple through the whole process. 
In fact, if you have another device like an iPhone, the Vision Pro will communicate with it and it'll practically set itself up. A few minutes after putting that thing on, I was up and running. On the negative side, I have no idea why Apple made the decision to not include application organization or reordering. This feels like iOS 1.0 all over again with my alphabetically sorted apps and multiple screens to scroll through. It's just ridiculous. One of the biggest complaints that I have about iOS is that it doesn't handle multiple users using the same device. And I'm afraid that the Vision Pro is headed in the same direction as well. Thankfully, there is a guest mode that you can enable, but it's half-baked at best, and it's not a good experience for a family who might want to share devices with multiple members of the household. Apple has always had a weird thing about letting people share devices. We have three iPads in my house for absolutely no reason other than the fact that Apple decided to make the iPad a single-person device. I can't think of a time when more than one was ever in use at the same time, but since we can't switch profiles and there's not a good way for us to have our own data and settings, we're stuck with three iPads. Apple can't honestly think that people are going to shell out thousands of dollars for multiple headsets just so that every family member can have their own. Maybe Apple does expect you to have multiple headsets. I don't know. They created a feature called SharePlay that lets you connect with other people over FaceTime and have shared experiences with supported applications. I haven't had a chance to explore it yet, but it does look promising for both business and entertainment purposes. I've used similar features on other devices and it's amazing how useful and how fun it can be. A few reviewers have already mentioned the virtual keyboard and how clumsy it can be. And while that's true, it's no clumsier than any other virtual keyboard implementation I've seen in a headset. Actually, in a lot of ways, it's better because the gaze and pinch feature keeps you from having to point at things in space with your hands or controllers. It's still not a great experience though, especially when you're trying to edit text or make corrections, and I find myself reaching for a keyboard when I have to do more than write a quick sentence or two. Another nuisance problem, in my opinion, is that the keyboard keeps getting in the way when I'm trying to use it. I've had password prompts cover the fields, and it's done other things that are a pain to deal with. I'm sure this is something that'll eventually get fixed with software updates, though. One of the big selling points of the Apple Vision Pro is that you can display your computer on a floating virtual monitor. Me and a lot of other people would love to have a way to have a portable desk with multiple monitors that we can take with us anywhere, or the ability to use virtual monitors to reduce the clutter on our physical desks. Sadly, that's not something that the Apple Vision Pro can do. At the moment, it's limited to a single 1440p display that's streamed from your computer. It's fine for doing a little bit of work, but text can be hard to read, and the promise of having a 50-inch monitor in front of you is tempered by the fact that the resolution is set, and it doesn't actually give you any more screen real estate. There are third-party companies like Immersed who plan to bring their remote display application to the Apple Vision Pro. I hope they do it quickly, or that Apple gives us some more options. Otherwise, this feature with so much potential is little more than a gimmick. Apple products have always worked well together, and the Apple ecosystem is a huge selling point for any Apple product. The saying, it just works, is never truer than with Apple products. For example, with the Mac Virtual Display running, you can select a Vision OS app and use your connected keyboard and trackpad in that app. That's pretty cool. You can also seamlessly copy and paste between your computer, phone, or tablet and the Vision Pro. That's especially handy for managing things like passwords, especially since most password managers aren't available in Vision OS at the moment. What I do find odd, though, is that I can't use Face ID authentication on my phone with my headset on. The Apple Vision Pro has an optic ID unlock feature, which works really well. And my Apple Watch has a feature that unlocks the phone. But if I need to, for example, open up my password manager or a two-factor authentication app, I have to take the Apple Vision Pro off, uh, do a facial scan for that to work. I would really love to see the Apple Vision Pro pass that authentication from Optic ID through to my other devices to handle the unlock for me. Apple also does a great job of standardizing hardware and operating systems, which gives developers a reliable target to build for. Part of the problem that we've had so far with other VR platforms is that they're so fragmented. Each one is running their own operating system, they have their own control schemes, and they each work a little bit differently. One of the things Apple is good about is that they offer standardization of hardware and software along with clear guidelines for developers. Okay, maybe not clear guidelines, but at least clearer guidelines than the other guys. I mentioned earlier about the eyesight feature that lets people nearby see a rendered representation of your eyes. Well, 
if that's not creepy enough, Apple had to double down on the creepiness by creating a virtual representation of your entire face called Personas. I understand that the Persona feature right now is in beta, but wow. Uh, I guess they had to start somewhere though, and at least it lets you use FaceTime, Zoom, and Microsoft Teams while you're in the headset. I really wish Apple would let us use Memojis rather than these abominations though. We're used to cartoonish avatars, and I would take those any day over the nightmare fuel that this thing shipped with. Moving on to the App Store, here we find another disappointment. I don't think there's any excuse for the App Store being as bad as it is in Vision OS. It's not nearly as robust as the App Stores inside of the iPhone or the iPad or even the Mac. And I'm not talking about the number of apps either, because there are plenty of apps between the native Apple Vision Pro apps and the compatible iPad apps. There's just a lot of stuff that seems to be missing, such as categories to find what you might be looking for, and a back arrow button that might take you to the previous page, or it might take you to an app you looked at five minutes ago. I don't know. I know that these are software issues and they'll get fixed over time, but this is not Apple's first rodeo. They've already solved these problems in other places, so why are they here in this incredibly expensive so-called professional device? I expected there to be a relatively limited number of apps at launch, and we all knew about things like Netflix and YouTube that weren't going to be available, but I was surprised to see just how many iPad apps have opted out. The fact that I can't get to the files that I have sitting in Dropbox, Google Drive, or OneDrive is really disappointing to me. I'm sure those things are going to come eventually, but the fact that they're not there right now makes this a non-starter for me productivity-wise. Aside from flagship apps like Disney+, Plus, Max, and a few others, the Vision OS apps, well, they're not very good at the moment. There are a lot of things that feel like tech demos or that just plain don't work. Yes, they'll get weeded out eventually, but I'm surprised that they got through the app review process in the first place. The other thing that I want to talk about is the app experience. Right now, most apps are not taking advantage of spatial computing the way that, in my opinion, they could or should. Compared to what's available on some other platforms, what I'm seeing right now on the Apple Vision Pro looks like 2D apps that are floating in 3D space with look and pinch support. They really could be doing a lot more with it than they are right now. Again though, I get it. This is a 1.0 device and most developers haven't had it in their hands yet. They've only had a simulator to work with. I'm not saying anything negative about the developers who created the apps that were available at launch. I know they're working hard, and I know it's taken an incredible amount of time and effort to create these apps, but I definitely think that there's a long way for them to go, especially to catch up with some of the other software that we're seeing elsewhere. There are some apps that I love on other platforms, and I'm very disappointed that they aren't available for Vision OS yet. Tools like Gravity Sketch, Shapes XR, and Engage are well established and would have been excellent creative and professional showcase apps. It would have been huge to have them at launch. I know at least some of them are working on Vision OS apps, but I think those are companies that Apple should have been reaching out to much sooner. Now, I have a lot more thoughts about how things could work or should work, but this is all still so new and everything will change as new applications come out and when bugs get fixed. Just like my thoughts and feelings about Vision Pro changed over the last few days, I'm sure they'll continue to do that over the next few weeks and months. I already have follow-up videos in the pipeline to talk about use cases like communication, collaboration, creation, and education, and I'm going to do a comparison video against traditional VR headsets to highlight the similarities and differences. Not necessarily because the devices are comparable, but because the use cases have a lot of crossover. And don't forget about the app reviews. There are going to be a lot of things to explore here. I look forward to sharing more of my thoughts and opinions with you, and I hope you got something from this video. If you want to see more upcoming videos, please subscribe, hit that like button, and leave a comment to let me know what you want to see. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.